Hi, everyone. Thank you for stopping by. My name is Stana Jergova. I'm a senior research associate in a Dr. Sagan's lab, and I will be presenting you our results with the a recombinant GABAergic cells used as a treatment for the, uh, for, the, for the chronic pain. So pain is uh, defined as a, and it is, is a, defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that is associated with the actual or potential tissue damage. And, um, but despite this, of this uh, negative connotation, uh, the pain is very essential for our survival. Uh, pain serves a very important warning function and, and preventive um, function. If, if, if it gives us the um, warning if there is some um, injury uh, happening, if there is some internal disease uh, that we cannot uh, really assess right away. It has important protective function and it helps with the recovery after the uh, injury itself. Uh, the, and it resolves with the healing of the initial injury. All this is true for the normal physiological pain. Uh, the story is different when we're talking about the pathological pain. Pathological pain is so-called a bad pain. That, that's the pain that you want to get rid of. Um, the, the pain is chronic. That chronic pain has no adaptive value and it persists uh, beyond the, the original injury. Uh, here is a brief uh, description or, or yeah, description of the major pain types and how our um, noceptive system uh, respond to the stimuli from the, from the outside. So during the normal noceptive processing, when there is no injury, nothing is happening, like our noceptive system is, is being responsive only if the, if the threshold coming from the periphery threshold of the stimulus, uh, I mean, the, the intensity of the stimulus reach certain threshold. When the threshold is higher, we feel more pain. When, when the stimulus is not present, we are fine, we don't feel anything. When the actual injury is happening and there is like slight inflammation, then the area with the injury will become a little bit hypersensitive. We may feel the pain without presence any stimulus. We may feel the pain uh, when some non nociceptive non-painful stimulus is applied. Uh, that effect is called uh, uh, allodynia. But either this um, type of pain, it, it helps the uh, it helps us to recover and to protect the, the part of the body that is injured and it helps to recover of this injured body part. And again, it, um, uh, it's reversible. Uh, on the other side, the chronic pain. The chronic pain is persistent. Uh, the response of our noceptive system is, is different than the response during the, those normal uh, noceptive kind of pain or, or like a short inflammatory pain. Uh, there is a pain present without any stimulus. There is a pain present with no noceptive stimuli. So, and, and all those responses are exaggerated compared to this other pain state that I described. Uh, the, the chronic pain is therefore one of the most um, common conditions that the people seek the, the medical attention. And uh, uh, there's all, uh, more than 50 million Americans uh, are disabled with the chronic pain. And the, the treatment uh, of the chronic pain, and not just the treatment, but also like the, the, the loss of productivity and medical costs and loss of income are, are very costly for those patients and, and for the families. Uh, the treatment options for these patients are very uh, limited. The, the pain does not respond to the regular um, analgesics, and therefore we have to look for, for some um, alternative treatment approaches. Here are the, the list of the uh, of the different classes of so-called chronic neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is the pain that is caused by the damage of the nervous system. And this damage may happen because of some mechanical injury, because of some metabolic uh, uh, disorders, uh, viral infection, and, and so on. Uh, the ones that I will be presenting today, the, the ones that our lab is, is focused mostly, uh, are the traumatic mechanical injury kind of uh, chronic neuropathic pain. We use the models of peripheral nerve injury, and the models of spinal cord injury. So as I say, this chronic pain persists beyond the, uh, the, uh, the healing of the original injury and uh, the treatment that targeting the original pathology may not be essential for the, for the chronic pain uh, in those patients. So uh, after the peripheral nerve injury, there is this uh, initial response of our system uh, the, with, the, with a strong inflammatory response to the original injury that takes a couple of hours, couple of days, 
and it's uh, followed by this anti-inflammatory phase that is uh, related to the um, regeneration as the peripheral nerve system has a certain um, ability to, to regenerate to, to a certain point. The um, events that are taking place during this, like a first phase during this very strong um, inflammatory events going on in a, in a peripheral nerve, and also affects the neurons in, in a spinal cord and the signaling and the sensitivity of those neurons in a spinal cord. And those events, the um, um, different um, uh, release of, of different neurotransmitter and uh, expression of the trans transcription factors may uh, uh, build the base for the development of, of the chronic pain. Similarly, after the spinal cord injury, the, the initial, um, the acute phase of the spinal, spinal cord injury uh, or injury of the certain nervous, cert, uh, central nervous system is related to the, to the impact, to the direct impact of, of the trauma. Uh, and the secondary injury is then uh, related more of these, uh, all these uh, pro-inflammatory um, molecules that are released in the, in the place of the, of the injury. And the chronic pain is related to the inability of the central nervous system to regenerate. So there is like a glial skull is forming that is disruption of the uh, white matter and the gray matter. And again, those initials, um, uh, the, the impact of the, of the higher inflammation of the uh, glutamate excitotoxicity, again, may change the processing of in our nociceptive system, the processing of the pain signals or the signals coming from the periphery. And, and those signals may be processed in a different way and then uh, may establish uh, or may be the base for the development of, of the chronic pain that will persist even with, with the, the initial injuries partially healed or is taken care of, the pain may be present in those patients. So the patients with the chronic pain, uh, they are in some kind of vicious circle because the, the chronic pain prevents them from activity. The, the reduced activity creates more pain because it's related to the progressive deconditioning of their body, of their muscles to move. Every move just create more pain and, and just create further avoidance of the activity all those things exaggerate the pain those patients are feeling, and this is uh, related to the to the psychological state of those patients. Uh, there is a lot of uh, those psychological issue when the people are, you know, are in a constant pain and, and they are not moving, they are not active. There is a sleep dis uh, disorders, this anxiety, fear, um, distress, depression, and all this again contributes to the to the exaggerating of the pain of those patients. So, to uh, find some treatment to help those patients at least to reduce uh, those all those like uh, other symptoms and just the pain itself, but, but help them with the activities and help them to reduce the, the, uh, the, the depressions and all those other side effects of the, of the chronic pain that will be very beneficial for those patients. So as I say, the treatment options are limited and uh, for those chronic patients with the severe pain, there are like several uh, levels of the um, suggested pharmacological medication. The, the first level is um, are usually uh, gabapentinoids or tricyclic antidepressants. The second one is stronger, the, the opioid analgesics, then cannabinoids, and then four-line agents that may not be primarily developed to, to treat the pain, but they may have with these depressions or, or sleep disorders and stuff like that. Anyway, so since we're talking about the chronic pain, those patients has to be medicated for a longer time. And that is uh, contributes to the development or the presence of this opioid crisis that um, uh, we can observe in these days. This table from the data from 2019 show the uh, the uh, death per 1,000 um, people. Uh, I mean, from from the overdose from the opioids medication compared to some other drugs that are there like heroin. So there's many more people dying from the overdose of the opioids than uh, from the other illegal drugs. So that, uh, that's why there is like a strong need to develop some uh, novel treatment approaches. Um, to do that, in order to, to develop those uh, treatment approaches, we need to um, be able to understand how the pain develops, uh, what kind of um, effects are taking place in the peripheral and, and the central nervous system. So this cartoon, uh, this is a simplified um, a cartoon of uh, of the events on, on a, on a, in a spinal cord in the process of central sensitization that plays a role in the development of chronic pain. So after the nerve injury peripheral or central nerve injury, uh, there is increased release 
of the neurotransmitter from primary afferent fibers, increased release of glutamate, increased release of the, of the calcium, um, increased expression of the, of the calcium channel of those primary sensory uh, neurons, uh, increased expression of the NMDA receptors, the glutamate receptors in the nociceptive neurons in, in the spinal cord, and all those contribute to the hyperactivity of those receptors, uh, of those neurons, the hypersensitivity, and they, the signals they are selling to, sending to brain is decoded as a pain signal. Um, then there is a contribution of the neurons that, or, or the primary afferent fibers and the neurons that in a normal situation does not contribute to the pain signaling. They are not part of the nociceptive system. They're more contributing to the signaling of, of regular um, uh, mechanical stimuli from the, from the periphery, like vibration and touch and stuff like that. So uh, in this, um, uh, after the nerve injury, also those neurons may contribute by releasing the glutamate, may contribute to the uh, sensitization of the neurons in the a, in a spinal cord, the nociceptive neurons in the spinal cord. Uh, the other big factor that, that's happening, uh, that has been observed in, in, the, in those chronic patients, in, in patient and in the animal models, is the disinhibition. Uh, there is reduced release of, of GABA or um, uh, reduce uh, expression of the of the GABA receptors and in, in, in the neurons uh, in a spinal cord that continue to the exaggerated uh, pain signaling uh, from the nociceptive neurons in the brain uh, in the spinal cord, and then is also the contribution of the microglial uh, activity there uh, may also stimulate the nociceptive neurons. So the treatment approaches to um, they are targeted to the chronic neuropathic pain. Um, are focused on those three or four mechanisms. So it's it's targeting the uh, the uh, the primary the afferent uh, signaling with the presynaptic uh, calcium uh, channels and then postsynaptic NMDA channels. So this is targeting the glutamate excitatory uh, neurotransmission. Uh, we're trying to reduce the excitatory neurotransmission. We're trying to enhance the inhibition, and and we're trying also to reduce the um, glial activation in. Um, in a spinal cord. The uh, pharma pharmacological approaches to, to target those mechanisms, um, uh, there are like several ch challenges, like the major one is, is the side effect of any uh, drugs that is used in, in a longer uh, time. Uh, it could be a, you know addiction or, or developing of the tolerance, so then you need higher and higher dose of the drugs to, to uh, achieve the same effect as, as you see at the, at the very beginning. Uh, the, some of the of the analgesic compounds, they are not able to penetrate the blood brain barrier or just penetrate in a very low amount. So you need to, to, devil, uh, to deliver them differently. And, and one way to deliver them is to use the intratechnical catheters. Uh, this approach is, is, is helpful for the patient, but it's also costly and, and may be also um, associated, associated with the generation of some inflammatory responses. Uh, the experimental approaches that we are um, working on in, in this lab and in general, like the, the pain research that is looking for is to target this disinhibition by um, providing uh, gabaergic cells, by transplanting the gabaergic cells into, in, in our animals. Uh, the other way is to use the gene therapy. So to have those analgesic peptides that that has the analgesic effect uh, and, and use their cDNA and, and uh, transplant either like create a, the viral vector or, or some, some form of, of the delivery agents and then transplant those into the, into the spinal cord or uh, engineer the recombinant cells as I will be talking uh, about today. And the third option that we are uh, exploring in our lab is to use the agent therapies, the, the physical activity, the treadmill training, and, and potentially the the swim training as the physical activity has been shown in the, in the patients, in the human patients, to also reduce the chronic pain in, in the people that suffer from the chronic pain. So uh, here I will be uh, briefly describing the models of the uh, peripheral nerve injury and the spinal cord injury that we are using in our lab. So in, this is the cartoon of the sciatic nerve and, and the, the three spinal nerves and the DRG of the, that is related to the sciatic nerve. So there are different form of um, constriction or transaction of the sciatic nerve on a different levels. 
uh, there is a spare nerve injury, partial nerve injury, ligation of the, of the spinal nerve. The ones that we are using is so-called chronic constriction injury, where there are four ligatures placed around the sciatic nerve. It causes partial constriction, it causes inflammation. And the animals uh, in this model, they develop the hypersensitivity to the mechanical and uh, thermal stimuli. Uh, for the spinal cord injury models, again, there is like many of them. Most of them are um, dealing like, most of them are more focused on uh, creating some paralysis and then uh, uh, checking or, or uh, testing some regeneration approaches. Uh, in our lab, we are using the compression model uh, of the spinal cord injury when there is a clip applied on, on a spinal cord. Those animals develop paralysis uh, one to three days post injury, but then they spontaneously recover to the point they are able to, to use their hand pose, they are able to move. And, uh, but they are also developing the, uh, the hypersensitivity in their high pons, the hypersensitivity to tactile, to heat, and to the cold uh, stimuli, as we've as we shown in our previous um, studies. So now I will be describing how we evaluate that pain in animals. And now I just want to point to that pain thing. So uh, when we're talking about the pain research in animals, we, we, what, what we can evaluate, what we can see in those animals, it's not really a pain, it's, it's, it's a nociception. It's increased nociception, it's hypersensitivity of those animals to the certain stimuli. Because pain, as I defined it at this first slide, is, is, is emotional experience. You have this emotional part of it. There is a nociceptive system. There is this, um, uh, the emotions that are related to it. And all those together will give you some final feeling that you can describe, like if it's painful or it's a pleasure for you. So, and it's individual in, in every patient. So from the patient, you can talk about the pain when, when they will tell you like, if they are in pain or not in pain. In, in animals, we can just assess their sensitivity to the certain stimuli. So this is what we are doing in our pain research in animals. So we are assessing the evoked hypersensitivity and then spontaneous hypersensitivity. So evoked hypersensitivity is based on uh, stimulating the, the animals. In our cases, we are using the hypo of, of the animals with either nociceptive or non-nociceptive stimuli, and we are checking the response of the animal. The response is, is the PO withdrawal, but it's not just that one that we are looking for. We are also looking for more uh, complex behavior for the animals, uh, you know, turning to the stimulus, walking away from the stimulus, vocalization, or, or some uh, sign of, of the animals, like the, the, the animals is in, a, is in some form of, of discomfort. It's not just a reflexive um, removal of the, of the pop. So this is the evoked hypersensitivity. And then the other group of the, uh, of the uh, pain tests that, that are used in, in, the, in the pain research in animals is to check for the spontaneous hypersensitivity for, for ongoing pain in those animals. And those, that group of tests is based on some pre-training of the animals to, uh, for the certain conditions where uh, it's, it's usually based on the on animal preference of the darker places instead of the, of the lighter, uh, lighter um, side of the cage, lighter places. So, but if, if there is some uh, positive stimulus, um, uh, uh, joined with, with this like a light uh, side of the cage associated with the light side of the cage, the animal, if the animals are getting some benefits from that uh, stimuli, the animals will develop the preference for this originally non-preferred side of the cage. And then we can see if, you know, we can evaluate like how much the animals are is, is looking for the relief that they are getting on the white side of the cage. Of course, there has to be proper control so we can evaluate we are not evaluating dependence of the animals on the drugs so we have a proper control and we can see the animals in pain they prefer this side of the cage because this side of the cage is, is, is associated with some kind of analgesics versus the normal animals or animals with, with sham injury they still like hang out more in the darker places so those are the, the tests that are used for them uh, to evaluate the spontaneous hypersensitivity um, so now, uh, what we are doing in our lab, the, the our research approach, as I said, like uh, we are trying to uh, to target this reduced inhibition. Uh, the reduced ex there is a reduced expression uh, of the of the GABA when we are checking the GABA based on a, on an immunostaining. There is a reduced expression of the of the enzyme of uh, glutamic acid, uh, acid decarboxylase. In, uh, this is the in a CCI model, in the model of peripheral nerve injury. So 
you have a reduced expression of the GAD on the ipsilateral side, you have a reduced expression or the reduced presence of the, of the GABAergic neurons and compared to the contralateral side here on the ipsilateral side. Uh, similarly, in the spinal cord, those green ones here are the GABAergic neurons. You don't see that many uh, them in, in the animals with a spinal cord injury. Uh, the reason why there are not so many neurons, there are still like several hypotheses. Uh, the studies, they were comparing numbers of neurons between the, you know, in this model, for example, between the ipsilateral, between contralateral and ipsilateral side, they find out that the numbers of the neurons is the same between those animals, but the number of the, uh, the neurons that are showing gabaergic phenotype is different. So the, also the, uh, the electrophysiological studies show reduced uh, inhibitory potential in, in those, uh, in the spinal cord of animals that have uh, peripheral nerve injury in this case. So to uh, approach this problem, uh, we are using, we and other labs, uh, we are using uh, GABAergic cells derived from the, from the rat embryos and we are transplanting those cells to the animals and then we are assessing the analgesic effect of, of those cells. So the cells are um, harvest from the E14 or 13 and a half embryos from the medial ganglionic eminence. They are cultured, the GABAergic phenotype is, is uh, confirmed in, in the cell cultures by you know, uh, cytochemistry. And then those cells are used, but not only in pain studies, as this, this diagram shows, they are used in, in some other uh, treatment uh, of some other pathologies as a Parkinson or schizo schizophrenia and Alzheimer's diseases. So in our case, we are using those cells uh, for transplantation into the dorsal neurons in a, in a spinal cord, and then we are assessing the under effect. So these are our very um, early studies that we are uh, uh, we use those uh, GABAergic cells in a model of a peripheral nerve injury. We have those are the animals in in the blue color here. Here, so uh, you can see there was some benefits. Uh, when it comes to the pain reduction or reduction of the hypersensitivity of those animals that receive our, our graft uh, for mechanical heat and cold um, uh, sensitivity. We also uh, conducted uh, electrophysiological assessment. We have found the animals with the graft. Uh, they have, uh, uh, we, we were able to describe the reduced wind up, so the reduced hypersensitivity of the receptive neurons in the spinal cord and also the post discharges in those uh, animals that receive the graft were reduced. Uh, we uh, assess uh, similarly the effect of the GABAergic cells in a spinal cord uh, injury model. Uh, those animals with the graft are in the, uh, red and blue. So you can see after the transplantation of those cells, either early post injury, two weeks, or in the more chronic stages, four or five weeks post injury or six. Um, we got the effect. Uh, for, for a couple of weeks, but then the effects like slowly decline in, in both cases, in the early and in the post and a more chronic uh, injection. And the, similarly, in, in, the spinal, in, the, in the model of CCI, we got the effect, but for a couple of weeks, but then the effect uh, slowly declined. So to um, approach this issue um, and, and to uh, preserve the beneficial effect of, of the GABAergic cells for a longer time, one of the approaches is to um, to engineer recombinant cells. Recombinant GABAergic cells that will release additional analgesic peptide. Uh, the, there are several of peptides that, that are used in, in, um, for that kind of research. In our lab, we are uh, working with the, I, I just put the list uh, of some of them here. So we are working with the certain histogranin. There's a peptide that is targeting the NMDA receptors, the glutamergic signaling in the spinal cord. We are using endomorphins. Those uh, uh, are uh, tar the endomorphic target, the, the opioid receptor signaling. Uh, then we're doing a lot of research with the conopeptides. Those are the peptides uh, derived from the conos venom. And the ones we are, we are using right now, it's uh, affecting the calcium signaling. And we are looking for other, other uh, compounds within those venoms that may target also the cannabinoid receptor signaling. And um, the other peptide that we're using was CGRP-837 in our pain models in a, in a migraine, but I will not uh, be presenting this one, but this is also one of the peptide that is um, that can be used for the, for the gene therapy or cell therapy in our, in our pain models. 
So I will start with the, with the certain histogranin story that certain histogranin has been, or histogranin has been isolated and characterized in, in the 90s. That's a peptide uh, naturally occurring. It has the NMDA receptor uh, antagonist activity. The certain histogranin is the um, synthetic analog of the histogranin. And uh, our previous studies with, with the certain histogranin that showed that it reduced the activity of the neurons that are stimulated with the NMDA in, in, this, uh, in this plot. So after the uh, injection of the certain histogranin, uh, the activity of the neurons dropped. They were stimulated with, with the NMDA. Similarly, in uh, assessing the behavioral response of the animals that were stimulated with the NMDA by intratrical injection, the uh, injection of the of the SAG or saline, saline is the uh, dash, the, uh, the this this line, the the SAG is the uh, solid line. So the injection of the SAG 15 minutes after the injection of the NMDA uh, leads to blocking the. Um, the effect of the NMDA and, and, and the response of the animals get back to the, to the baseline, basically. So uh, based on those uh, data, so our approach was to generate, uh, to, use, to, use the, uh, to use the certain histogram in, in, in a form of, uh, for our gene therapy or, or to generate the engineer to recombine cells. So to do that, um, we, or Dr. Kashavelti and, and his team, uh, they uh, engineer uh, a gene construct uh, with uh, with the, uh, that encodes a certain histogranin, but this construct has been designed in a way that this part, that the middle one, or the part in yellow here, is interchangeable. So there will be other uh, analgesic peptide inserted here, or there will be like more copies of the certain histogranin. This is what we did: uh, more copies of certain histogranin inserted into this um, into this place. The construct has a fluorescent label. The construct has a certain uh, um, signaling labels that, that direct the, uh, the, the RNA into the, into the secretory pathways and there are construct or our analgesic peptide is released uh, from the cells. The initial studies uh, has been conducted with the, with the different kind of cells, with the, with the hex cells, with the P12 um, cells, PC12 cells, Miami cells. And they have been able to, uh, to detect the, the release of certain histogranin from those cells. So um, we use this construct. We generate a construct that encodes one copy of certain histogranin or six copies of certain histogranin. And we generated the, the recombinant GABAergic cells. We use GABAergic, uh, we harvest the GABAergic cells from the rats embryos. Uh, we treat them with the, with the lentivirus or AAV virus uh, encoding the certain histogranin. And then we check for the presence of the certain histogram in those cells. The, um, the cells were displaying the uh, proneural mm -hmm. phenotype, the cells were displaying the GABAergic phenotype, and also the, uh, the SAG was present there. Uh, we, were present, uh, we were detecting the SAG release from the cells, so the, uh, the presence of the SAG in the cell supernatant, and we were also uh, be able, uh, we were able to uh, detect the presence of the SAG there. And the, the, the um, uh, amount of SCG release from those cells were uh, kind of related to like how many molecules of the SAGs were encoded by this uh, viral vector that we introduced into the cells. So the cells with run SAG was a little bit less than the cells that um, were transformed with the, with the viral vector uh, encoding six copies of the SAG. And then we transformed those cells into the animals with a spinal cord injury and we were checking the uh, the analgesic effect of those cells, and we have found out that indeed the, the recombinant cells in the in the green and orange, uh, in the red and orange, they have a uh, much more stronger and much more potent and longer lasting effect, analgesic effect, compared to the animals uh, that were uh, grafted only with the with the regular non-recombinant GABAergic cells. Uh, so these. Um, uh, then we also evaluated the, the presence of the of the certain histogranin in the spinal cord of animals, uh, in the spinal uh, in the spinal homogenates. Uh, we published this paper in the pain, and, and one of those pictures get also on, on the cover of the pain journal. So I was very happy about that. So those um, uh, results were very exciting. Uh, 
uh, uh, we were also like, um, I'm not going to present this, I'll just mention that we are also playing uh, like to uh, generating the compound construct that encodes the certain histogram and the endomorphins that I mentioned before, as those two uh, kind of work synergistically. So we were testing um, those compounds in our, um, in our pain models. So that was one story with the certain histogram. Uh, the other story is the story with the conopeptides. Not to get rid of this. Um, so the conopeptides has been described by Professor Oliveira from uh, University of Utah. Uh, the conopeptides are uh, present in a, in the venom of the conus snail. Uh, then uh, those snails are using those venoms to uh, uh, for their feeding for the killing those little the little. Um, there are 700 species of those con snails, and, and the venom uh, com uh, comprised of these uh, hundreds of the small uh, peptides that are uh, involved in, in the research for the for the various reasons. Many of them are very potent and highly selective for the specific ion channels, and uh, that's why the uh, they are very interesting for the for the pain research. They're also poor immunogens, so they are not eliciting. Uh, much of the uh, immune response. Um, so as I said, there are like many uh, classes of the conotoxins and within those uh, different classes, they are very specific for the different uh, channels. Some of them, many of them uh, are involved in, um, in uh, some preclinical or clinical trials uh, as, as a potential targets or potential treatments for the, for the uh, chronic pain. One of them, the M7A, this kind of that of prior, has made it to the finish line, has uh, got the FDA approval, and it's currently is used uh, for the patient with severe uh, chronic pain, that, that the patients that are intolerant or refractory to the other treatment. The way it's used, it's used in a, in a form of intratecal infusion, since it's not penetrating the blood bed barrier, it has to be uh, delivered uh, via the intratecal pumps. So again, in our approach, to avoid using this drug with the, uh, uh, for the intra uh, in the form of the intratecal infusions, we are we were trying to um, develop the the gene construct that can be used either for as a gene therapy as, as a direct injection of the gene construct into the into the spinal cord of the animals in the chronic pain models, or to generate the recombinant cells. So as a, the the M seven A is a uh, calcium channel uh, inhibitor or target in the calcium channel. Uh, the story with the with this the M7A it's uh, it's kind of related to the very first um, project that I was working on back when I was an undergrad student back in Slovakia when I joined the um, Institute of Neuroscience in, in my in my country and one of the first projects we dealing we were dealing with the pain was uh, to evaluate the upregulation of the alpha one uh, beta subunits in in, in the pain models. So, uh, and, and this is what, what we have found out in the models of, this, of the peripheral nerve injury, there is a regulation of this specific subunit and it plays an important role in the development of pain, not only in this model, but uh, 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 in any other models as well. So then when I came to the, to the lab of Dr. Sagan and, and they were just starting with the, doing the research on these conopeptides, uh, and especially with this m 7 is targeting those, uh, the, uh, calcium channel, it was like a nice opportunity for me to kind of like contribute what I started like a couple of years ago back home. So the uh, antinoceptive effect of, of the M7A has been described in, in several models by, by Dr. Hama in our lab. So he described the, uh, the dose response and antinoceptive effect after the formal injection, after the spinal cord ligation, after the spinal cord uh, compression. And, um, and then the our research was further uh, focused on, on developing of this uh, viable gene construct that, that can be used for either gene therapy or, or the cell therapy. So um, with my experience uh, or my previous work on all those calcium channels, and when I joined the lab, I, I learned a lot about you know, the, the gabargic cells and how to generate the recombinant cells, how to uh, generate those, uh, those genes constructs. So all this, my background, uh, I was, um, lucky to get the uh, uh, discovery award, uh, discovery award from the Department of Defense, and uh, continue kind of, or yeah, continue in my um, uh, this calcium channel business. 
uh, I was able to uh, uh, work on, on, on a project that uh, deals with the generator uh, engineering of the recombinant cells but that will be releasing the, the M7A and evaluating the, the analgesic effect of those cells in our pain models. So this is my recent project. So we were, uh, we harvest those cells, the E14 cells from the, from the radio embryos. Uh, we generate the recombinant cells. Uh, they were expressing the M7A. I was, uh, where I was able to um, confirm the expression of M7A in those cells. This is just a detailed one of those nice cells that are expressing the GABA and M7A. Together, we uh, analyze the phenotype of those cells. Most of them were uh, beta tubulin, so they have a proneural phenotype. They were also showing the presence of GABA. Uh, only very small number of the cells uh, uh, were showing the GFAP, the microglia or the astroglial phenotype. We were able to detect the presence of the GABA and, and uh, M7A in the supernatant uh, of those cell cultures. And then we use those cells in the, in the, uh, in this, uh, in the model of the chronic constriction injury. Uh, so the, the animals that receive the recombinant cells are in uh, blue in those plots. The animals with non-recombinant cells are red. So you can see all those blue lines uh, the animals that received the recombinant cells, they got much better effect, much uh, stronger analgesic response uh, than the animals treated with non-recombinant cells. Uh, we also checked the presence of the inflammatory neurotransmitter uh, or, or markers, the, the uh, interleukin beta, TNF alpha, and interleukin 10 in the uh, homogenates uh, of the spinal cord from those animals. Uh, we use the cells uh, also in the model of the spinal cord injury and we use male and female uh, in these um, studies just to uh, compare any uh, form of the, uh, the, the differences between males and females. Uh, again, we have found out the, the recombinant cells has a, a stronger and, and better effect than, than the non-recombinant cells. When it comes to the BBB score, we, there were like slight improvement, but overall, uh, the point was to show that uh, those recombinant cells doesn't, doesn't cause any harm to those animals. So the BBB score of treated and untreated animals are plus minus the same. This is kind of what we were expecting uh, as, as this, this treatment is not really focused on the regeneration, may contribute a little bit. But the uh, uh, main story here is to show up th that we are not worsening the, the state of the, of the animals after the injury. Uh, this is the example of one of those uh, assessment of the spontaneous pain when uh, the animals treated with, with the cells, they show a little bit um, uh, less the, the place escape of wetness behavior than the an untreated animals. Uh, similarly, in, in females, we have found out a uh, better effect of the animals that were treated, a better analgesic effect of the recombinant cells in those animals with the, with the injury for the cold hypersensitivity and heat hypersensitivity. Also, with the place escape avoidance, the treated animals show a little bit uh, less um, uh, escape behavior compared to the untreated animals. We have compared the effect of the M7A, how much of that M7A that is released, presumably from our cells, uh, uh, how much it affects the, the analgesic effect that we, uh, that we see in the animals. So we inject the animals intrathecally with the M7A antibody and we assess the animals before injection and after the injection. And we have for now the, the post-injection, the animals that were injected with the M7A. And those are all the data from the animals that received uh, the plot, the uh, recombinant cells. So after the injection of the, of the M7A, we have found out uh, the drop of the threshold or, or increased responses of the animals to the, to the tactile or stimulation. It's again, similar between males uh, and females. Uh, we also uh, were evaluating the uh, uh, level of the inflammatory cytokines in, in a spinal homogenates of those animals. And we have now treated the animals has less uh, uh, lower level of pro-inflammatory mediators. In some cases in females, it was even the significantly different between animals with non-recombinant cells compared to the, to the animals with the recombinant uh, cells. And here are some um, correlation analysis. Uh, so we correlate the, the, the level of the behavior, the values of the, that we got from those behavioral uh, tests 
with the with the with the level of the neurotransmitter or those uh, cytokines that we uh, observe with the with this ELISA test. If there is a correlation between the uh, you know the severity of the behavior and between the level, and we have found out uh, there is a correlation. Uh, those different color of the dots indicates the animals. Uh, the, just the control animals without any graft, the red ones are the animals with the non-recombinant cells, blue ones are the animals with recombinant cells. So you can see there is a correlation between the level of the of the pain behavior or hypersensitivity of those animals and the level of the uh, of the inflammatory mediators that we were able to detect in a spinal homogenates in a, uh, for the interleukin beta and TNF alpha, not that much in, in interleukin 10 in, in male animals, but in female animals, we were able to also uh, find out that correlation. So um, here are a couple of the uh, immunohistochemical pictures. This project is still uh, ongoing and, and I'm just wrapping up the, the results and hopefully there will be some paper coming out soon. Uh, so we were able to detect those recombinant cells in, in, a, in a spinal cord. Those are the purple cells. The red ones are with just checking if, if there is a localization with the, with the GFAP marker, marker for the astrobilal cells, and I haven't found uh, nothing, at least in, in the sections that I was examined so far. Uh, I was also uh, evaluated the presence of M7A in a spinal homogenase uh, using the FLYSA method. And we have found out um, that the M7A is present there in a much uh, higher level, like more than some background in, in, uh, in the animals that receive the, the uh, recombinant graft. The interesting results that I also uh, observed in that model, but also in, in, in previous ones, uh, even without the recombinant cells, that the transplantation of our GABAergic cells somehow help to, to restore the, the, uh, uh, the endogenous GABAergic cells in the spinal cord. So it is the, the, the loss, obvious loss of the GABAergic cells in, in the control animals with a spinal cord injury. And here is kind of like increased number of, of those neurons in, in the animals that were treated with either recombinant uh, or non-recombinant uh, cells. Uh, we're still working, there is just like a working hypothesis, like it could be because of the, of the grafted cells, they're also releasing some, um, you know, traffic factors that can be protective and they may, they may help to restore those neurons or the expression of the GABA uh, of these neurons in, in a spinal cord. So, these are the results that I wanted you to, um, uh, to show you today. Uh, the, uh, the current um, focus on our lab is, is uh, to develop something or, or to bring our knowledges and, and our uh, data more closer to the clinical application. So uh, all those recombinant cells that I was showing you today, they were derived from the, from the rat embryos, they were rat embryonic uh, cells. So we are looking for the uh, human source for, for these uh, cells that can be used in, in that kind of approach in the kind of cell therapy. And with the, uh, with the help of this inducible pluripotent stem cell technique, uh, we and others are able to uh, develop the human derived GABAergic cells that can be uh, tested in, in these pain models. And indeed we have started the collaboration with the Dr. Holly here from the Hasman Institute here in the UM. Uh, they were able to um, generate uh, several lines of those GABAergic cells from, from, from the patients. And uh, they were um, uh, provide those cells to our lab and I was able to test those cells. I will just skip to this, uh, just to show you the preliminary results. So these are the cells that were provided by the Dr. Kukir lab. Uh, they were already in, uh, uh, developed into the GABAergic phenotype. I've just uh, cultured them in our lab and then I use those cells uh, in, a, in a model of the spinal cord injury. And I have found out and, and I compare the effect of those cells to the to, to my rat GABAergic cells. So in some cases for the tactile hypersensitivity, I, I found out like those cells, uh, they have a better, better effect than, than the cells that we were using before in our models. Um, in uh, for the cold hypersensitivity, the, uh, the effect was plus minus the same, but again, those cells, I was also checking for the side effects. I haven't seen any uh, side effects. The only side effect that I have seen was before because of the uh, those animals has to be under strong immunosuppression. So, so sometimes those animals they don't uh, recover very well from the uh, from the from the surgery. They need a little bit uh, more treatment. 
uh, uh, than, than the animals that, that were receiving just the gabardic cells. Either those animals are also getting the, uh, the immunosuppression, but not as strong as, as the animals with the human cells. Uh, this one are the cells that are we purchased from the commercial source from the ATCC uh, company. And we were able with the, with the technical help from Dr. Kukier lab and for, with, the, with some published protocol, we were able to uh, uh, engineer, or not engineer, to, to culture the, or to transform those cells into the gabardic phenotype. And so now we will be, we will be uh, testing the sources, uh, the gabardic cells from different sources for their survival and for their analgesic effect in our model. So that's one of the uh, focus of our um, research currently. The other one is to use the larger animal models for our uh, spinal cord injuries and peripheral nerve injury. Uh, we are working this in collaboration with Dr. Kenneth Floyd from in the University of Utah. The, we are also working on some alternative delivery of therapeutic compounds. One of them is in collaboration with Dr. Uh, Courtney Dumont from the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, so we're playing with some, um, with some hydrogel. Uh, on, and other biomaterials that can kind of like en enca encapsulate our cells and then we will uh, uh, deliver the, these cells or, or this material with, with our cells into the spinal cord in order to keep those cells uh, either protected from the immune re uh, reaction of the, of the body or just to anchor the cells uh, and uh, to the certain part of, of the spinal cord. So we are experimenting with this one. We are also testing some RNA aptamers in collaboration with Dr. Liu from uh, uh, New York, University of New York. And we are incorporating our uh, physical activities into our models. We have several studies uh, with, the, with the treadmill training that we get very nice results. We are also starting with the, with the swim training of those animals as those activities, as I mentioned, are beneficial for the people with the, with the chronic pain. And some other ongoing studies in our lab the, the phantom limb pain study is one of the big projects that we are working on right now. Uh, we are also looking for the reduction of the morphine misuse. And uh, we are working with more conopeptides. We are evaluating more conopeptides and we're looking for something that can work on, um, on a CB1 receptor, CB2 receptors in those pain models. So with all this, I would like to conclude with the, with the acknowledging the people that helps me uh, in this, um, in those projects. Uh, so my thanks goes to the Dr. Sagan, of course, to my mentor for uh, having me for so many years in her lab. Uh, I want to thank Melissa Hernandez, either she is not the current member of our lab, but she was my merger, major, uh, major uh, surgical person for my discovery project. So I'm very helpful that um, I got such a talented uh, medical student. Uh, to help me in my project. Our current lab members, Angelica and Amanda, that they are doing a tremendous job with, with all those uh, multiple projects that are going on in our lab. Uh, Susan, Kevin, uh, Danny, Neil, and uh, Barbara, they were part of our pandemic lab crew. There are some of them are here. Uh, there are many more students that we were always uh, fortunate to get very, very talented students. They get like a lot of awards. Uh, and it's, it's very helpful to work with the students that are so extraordinary as, as, as the students that are in our lab. These are the former lab members or students that, that uh, contributes uh, to the resources that we're presenting. Former lab members, they were also my mentors when I joined the lab. I learned a lot from those people. The core facilities, Dr. Marcio and Dr. Uh, and Ramon German, uh, that helps always with the, uh, with the surgeries and, and with the animal related issues. Uh, the Miami uh, Project Imaging Core Histology and uh, Viral Vector Core, uh, Diane, um, you always and, and Yanya are always very helpful with, uh, with all the issues that I had during the imaging or the uh, generating of our vir uh, weird virus uh, compound construct. Uh, our collaborators that contributed to the results that I'm presenting, uh, the Dr. Vera and Dr. Imperial from University of Utah, and the other collaborators that I presented on my last slide that we just having those uh, initial uh, experiments going on, uh, the funding agencies and the uh, my little Miami core, Miami project fitness core support group that is now relocated in, uh, in a Christian Lynn uh, rehabilitation center. So we just thank all of you for your attention, for your presence. If you have any questions, suggestion or um, 
uh, proposal for collaborations. I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I will, okay. Okay, so I have a question from Dr. Dietrich uh, about how long do the gabardic cells survive after the, the transplantation? So with the, uh, all the animals that were giving the, uh, the, the graft from the, the, from the rat, uh, embryos were immunosuppressed with um, cyclosporin A. And we were able to detect the cells up to 12 weeks post uh, uh, grafting the cells in, in a model of the spinal cord injury. In a CCI model, it was, we finished this one after like six weeks, but uh, we were checking for the, for the longer survival in the spinal cord injury model. So we were able to see those cells even uh, at, the, at the very end of, of the study, like 12 weeks. The only thing was like, there is very, there's like really small amount of those cells that, that really like survive till the end. And this is something that was described in other studies as well. It's like, 10% of those cells that we, we uh, graft, they were able to make it to, uh, uh, to the very end. But either with the small amount of cells, we, were, we are still able to see uh, that beneficial effect of, of those cells in our that's, models. That's interesting. Um, and maybe it's because you're not putting the uh, cells actually into the area of uh, injury. You're putting them yeah. away from the area of yeah. injury. So that's, yeah. that's, that's interesting. Yes, it is. And then the other question is, any evidence of tumor genicity with the recombinant cell transplant, uh, human transplant, uh, okay, human uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells, translational approach, very exciting. So the, yeah, so this is the, with the, with this human inducible pluripotent stem cells, we are very, at the very beginning of, of this thing. So I don't have answer to the question of any potential tumor genicity, but that's something that we are looking for as, as, a, as a side effect. Uh, of, uh, in those animals, this is what we put in our grant proposal that we will be checking that kind of issues if, if there are some issues like that. Uh, with our with our red cells, we haven't seen any uh, effects like that, any side effects, any any, any form of, of tumors developing of those animals. Uh, but as I say, like with, with the human cells, we will be we will be uh, examining the tissue for the presence of any potential um, effect like this. Um, Okay, any other questions? We and others are now <clears throat> trying to think about, in addition, in, in, in contrast to um, injecting cells into the spinal cord of the brain, we're isolating exosomes from the cells and asking questions, uh, could the exosome itself actually uh, either injected systemically or locally uh, have an effect on receptor populations and maybe replicate what maybe a cell therapy will do. Yeah. Have you and um, Jackie thought about those types of approaches? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about like, this is one of the approaches that we will also be checking in our future studies using the using just the exosomes, not the whole cells, but just the, the exosome extra, yeah. So this is something that we would like to, to check as well. Nice presentation, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there are no more questions. Thank you, Tatiana. So I thank all of you and I'll see you. Have a nice day. Bye.